In this section, you'll learn about one of the most fundamental building blocks of machine learning, the humble perceptron. Whilst the name sounds a little scary, so long as you can multiply and add numbers, you should be able to understand how it works just fine. But before I dive into that, let's go back to our biological roots for intelligence, our own human brains. Your brain consists of around 86 billion or so interconnected biological neurons, a neural network if you will. Each neuron in the network responds to certain stimuli on its inputs, and the output of a single neuron may drive the inputs of many others connected to it. In your brain right now, there may be a bunch of neurons dedicated to recognizing some animal, like a cat or a dog. And some clusters of neurons will get excited when they see fur, and others will get activated when they see eyes, or even whiskers. And how active they become when they see certain features may depend on how confident they are that they correctly found that feature. Now each neuron's input is weighted differently. Maybe some input that comes from your ears for sound doesn't matter much if you're trying to look for whiskers on a cat, so it would have less voting rights or power if you will to activate that particular neuron that's only concerned with looking for cat whiskers. Now if all of these clusters of neurons fire at the same time and each is active enough to trigger the neurons connected above them to also fire, your brain tells you it saw a certain animal as shown in this illustration. In machine learning, artificial neural networks like the ones you see here are very loosely modeled on how we believe the human brain to work and are used to calculate the probabilities for features that they're trained to look out for. These are often called deep neural networks as there are many connected layers of neurons in the network to perform a task. Let's zoom in on just one of these artificial neurons shown in this diagram to break it down further to see what it's actually doing. So here you're zoomed in on one single artificial neuron. One type of artificial neuron is known as the perceptron. Now the concept of a perceptron dates back to the 1950s and is one of the most fundamental building blocks that made machine learning what it is today. Now I've actually hidden some things so I can reveal them to you one by one, so let's start going through them. First, this artificial neuron will sample some inputs just like the neurons in the brain did. These inputs, however, are always numerical and each input here essentially represents a feature from one item in your training data. Typically, inputs are normalized to have values ranging from zero to one so that they can be compared in a more relative way. But for this explanation, you'll see me use whole numbers to make it easier to follow along. It should be noted that if your input was a grayscale image, then each pixel would be a feature and you'd have a lot more than the seven inputs shown on the prior slide. A 100 by 100 pixel image would produce 10,000 inputs, but the principle would be the same. It's worth noting that a single neuron can have as many inputs as it needs to be able to sample everything it's connected to, which as you'll see later is defined by you. Next, each input is associated with something called a weight. You can visually see how the inputs with thicker lines have a higher weight and will end up contributing more to whatever's being calculated. Now, initially, before the perceptron is trained, these weights are just randomly chosen numbers, like the ones shown here. So this is just a starting point. These weights allow the neuron to amplify or reduce the value of each input if it decides that that input is more or less important respectively, in order to predict something useful when it trains itself. For now, just know that these are random numbers to start. You'll see how this enables it to learn later on. Next, something called a bias is added. This is just a single number that's initially randomly chosen just like the weights were. In this example, the number three is chosen randomly. And just like the weights, this neuron can change its value when it's learning if it needs to. So what you have here is the first half of a perceptron. When you pass data into the perceptron, it will take each input number and multiply it by its corresponding weight. These resulting values are then summed together, and finally the bias is added to this total to add an additional offset if it needs to. In the example shown here, the first input three would be multiplied by two, producing a value of six. The second input with a value of one would be multiplied by one, which would still be one. And the third input seven would be multiplied by three, producing 21 and so on for all the other inputs. If you add the results of these multiplications together and then add the final bias of three in this case, you'll get the number 42 as shown in the yellow circle. Now at this point, 
Don't get hung up on how this allows the neuron to learn. Just focus on understanding the maths that's going on here. The neuron is just calculating a bunch of weighted inputs that are summed together and then a bias is added to the total to give you some grand total. But how do you know if that grand total is sufficient to make the neuron get excited enough to send an output to anything that's connected to it, like you saw in the biological version of a neuron? Well, the last part of an artificial neuron is something called the activation function. All this means is that if the grand total calculated is greater than some threshold, then the neuron activates, providing some transformed output value. Let's take a look at the activation functions in a little more detail to understand this further. Jumping back to your high school maths class for just a second, imagine you had a line that was plotted as shown. You can see here that for all values of x that are below 30, it will give you a y output of 0. And for all values that are greater than 30, it will produce some output between 0 and 1 that steadily increases in size the larger the x value is over 30, up to a certain point at which it maxes out, whereby the value of 1 is produced for any number higher than that. Now, using the total value you saw from the example neuron you saw on the previous slides, you calculated the total of 42. If you fed 42 into this graph, the y output would be around 0 0.4 using this example activation function. Now, in mathematics, the name for the equation of a line that produces a certain graph shape like this is known as a function. As this special function defines when the neuron will activate to produce an output, you call this the activation function. And it turns out that in the real world, some folk who are much better at math than I am have defined a whole bunch of activation functions that you can tell the neuron to use when it's learning. Each has different properties that can be useful for certain tasks. The first one, for example, just lets the value pass through without any change as its equation is simply y equals x. Now, one of the most common ones you'll see at time of making this course is one named ReLU, which stands for Rectified Linear Unit, and it's actually similar in functionality to the example shown on the previous slide. Here you can see that the ReLU activation function will return 0 if x is less than 0, but if x is greater than 0, it will simply return whatever x is and just let it pass through with no upper limit on the value that can pass through. Okay, so putting it all together then, you now have the complete picture of an artificial neuron. Inputs are multiplied by the weights, those totals are summed together and added to a bias which creates a grand total that's sent through some activation function that transforms the number to provide some output value. In the case of a perceptron, the activation function simply outputs a 0 or a 1 depending if the total is above or below some threshold. It's this property that makes a perceptron a perceptron versus some other type of neuron that may produce different outputs. Essentially, a perceptron turns the inputs into a binary output. But how do you train a neuron and how is it by changing the weights and bias it's able to learn? Head on to the next section to find out.